loves you. You know how he loves me. I know how he loves you and me. What a great chorus. Why don't you sing it with me? And oh, how he loves you and me. I think somebody needed to hear that song today. So we're going to sing it through one more time. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? And oh, how he loves you and me. And oh, how he loves you and me. Well, God bless you. I'm Eddie Hyde. Welcome to God's Word to the World. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. And I'm uh, just going to have a great time in the Word of God and sharing truths that will, I believe, transform our lives. Hey, uh, I want to thank uh, my cousin, Parm Jackman. Now, I know Jackman's your maiden name, Parm, but I want to thank you. I can't think of your, your, your married name. But anyway, my cousin Parm, uh, I, I mentioned a woman pastor evangelist named Mary Jeffrey, and Parm gave this to my brother Pete who passed it along to me. And I did see Parm this past Sunday at the Gospel Lighthouse Church where I was preaching in Powderly. Anyway, she passed along this church bulletin from the Soper Assembly of God, and, and this is, is back from the 1940s. Uh, I, it doesn't have a date on it, but I know from some of the people I recognize inside. Uh, my uncle Frank Dawes, who pastored the Midway Assembly of God in Garrett's Bluff, Texas, for 51 years and has gone on to be with the Lord. He's a young man. His picture's on the inside. He's a Sunday school teacher. And uh, so anyway, uh, thank you, Parm, for sending this. And that's uh, Mary Jeffrey there in her younger days. Who, she's gone on to be with the Lord. Soper Assembly of God Church. Hallelujah. And yes, I was, uh, had such a blessed time this past Sunday morning and Sunday evening at the Gospel Lighthouse in Powderly, Texas, where uh, Chris and Faith Kelly are the, are the pastors. And, um, and this is a church, uh, longtime friends, uh, Sonny and Lynn Sparks pastored for many years, and Sister Lynn was there. And uh, Brother Sonny Sparks decided to go on to heaven here just a few days ago. And... Um, so what a blessing uh, they have been in my life, and I've preached there at the Gospel Lighthouse many times, and it was so good to see family and friends, and I believe that there was a genuine work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God that took place. Sunday morning, I preached about why are you afraid from Matthew 8, 26, where when the disciples were out and, and Jesus were in the boat out in the middle of the sea, and there was a terrible storm, it looked like they were going under, and they awakened Jesus, and, and uh, they said, Don't you care that we're perishing? You know, sometimes your peace looks like indifference to others. <laughs> and the fact that Jesus was living in peace looked like indifference. They said, Don't you care that we're going under? We're perishing. You know what Jesus said? He said, Why are you afraid? That was my message. Why are you afraid? And they didn't need to be afraid because Jesus was in the boat with them. 
And you don't need to be afraid because Jesus is in your boat, your lifeboat, your boat of life. He's with you also. And then Sunday night I preached about why are you so sad, which is what Jesus asked the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He was in his resurrection body. They thought he was dead. Their hopes had been dashed and crushed. And, and they were walking along seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus talking about this. And their faces were so long and sad. And Jesus joined them in his resurrection form and they didn't recognize him. But that was a question he asked. Why are you so sad? Why are your faces so long and so sad? <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> oh, and that's what he says to us. Why are you afraid? Why are you so sad? I'm alive forevermore, seated at the right hand of God with all power in heaven and in earth. Why are you afraid? Why are you so sad? Well, thank God that we can live in the faith, the confidence, and the boldness of Jesus Christ because of who he is. Hey, I want to just mention on uh, December the 7th, I'm going to be back in Paris. I'll be with my friends Charles and Delilah Hicks, 2110 Old Bonham Road. We'll have a, a, a wide open meeting there in, uh, on their property in a metal building, a mechanic shop. And oh, we've had some wonderful times in God's presence there. And then I'll be back with them on Sunday morning. That's December the 7th and 8th. So I hope you'll consider coming out and joining us. My, uh, my brother Pete, my sister-in-law Betty are always there and singing and and sharing and uh, other people. And so anyway, it's a very blessed time. Well, I want to read a, a scripture that's our scripture. And I say our, I'm talking about Sue, who's sitting over behind the controls right now. This is a scripture God gave us at the very beginning of our marriage. And it was a scripture that was to characterize our lives. And it says, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Hallelujah. Psalm 67, 1 and 2. Now, I feel to go ahead and read the next two verses also. And verse 3 says, Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nation on earth. Selah. Selah means stop and think about that. Well, wow. so God is exhorting his people to praise him and to be glad and to sing for joy. And that's what I was talking about Sunday night was the joy of the Lord. And uh, if you would like to have that message, I actually have it on a CD. The church has it, Gospel Lighthouse, but I also have it available. Okay. I want to share with you, and I, I, what I feel in my heart, I want to start a, a series of messages, and I want to talk to you about our nations, about America's Christian foundation, Christian beginnings, and not just a some kind of conventional formal Christian beginnings. I want to talk to you about the revivalistic beginnings because this country actually emerged out of a great spiritual awakening. Now, if you would like to read about this, I have written a book called America's Revival Heritage. And I believe you're seeing it there on the screen right now. And I will be happy to send you a copy, free, no strings attached, just because I know that it will bless you. And if you would like to have a copy, just send me an email and I'll be happy to send you a free copy, postage paid, of America's Revival Heritage. You know, probably uh, four years ago, between four and five years ago, I had given up hope of America ever seeing another national spiritual awakening. 
I'm not talking about a series of meetings in a local congregation that we call a revival. I'm talking about a work of the Holy Spirit that awakens an entire nation, that awakens communities, uh, that draws people back to God and changes the very culture, changes the very core and culture of a nation, of, a, of, of communities. And those things have happened in our past. But I had given up hope of seeing such a spiritual awakening ever happening again. And then about, I'm going to guess it's about four years ago, Sue and I were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was preaching for some friends who pastored a church of God in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Gary and Helen Barnhart, they're out in California now, but they were pastoring the Church of God in Kingfisher, Oklahoma, just north of Oklahoma City. And I was preaching for them on Sunday, and I was going to drive over on Saturday. So on Saturday, it was a beautiful summer day. The sun was shining, great day for our drive. And I wasn't trying to be overly spiritual or anything. I got in my car and um, was going to just enjoy the solitude and the drive. Pulled out on the interstate, and I was surprised by the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, unexpectedly, I know it was God. My mind and my heart started being flooded with thoughts and with hope and with expectation that America could, not would, but could, it's conditional, but that my heart and my mind was being flooded with thoughts of hope and expectation that our country could see another great spiritual awakening. And, and, and this stayed with me, my mind and my heart. And this came on me suddenly, unexpectedly. You know, Jesus said that the wind blows where it wishes. You can hear the sound thereof, but you, you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. And so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And what he was talking about, the unpredictability of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you can't put the Holy Spirit in a box and say, okay, at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we want the Holy Spirit to do this. <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid we've tried to do that too many times. But the Holy Spirit is a person, the third member of the triune Godhead. And as God, He has all the attributes of God. He has the mind of God, and He works and acts according to His own will, mind, and purpose. And sometimes He will work when we least expect it. And that day He worked at a time when I wasn't expecting it. But my entire approximate two hour drive, my mind was flooded with intense thoughts of hope and expectation that our country could see another great spiritual awakening. I could hardly wait to get to my hotel. I had my notebook computer with me. And as I'm driving, I can hardly wait to get my, to my hotel to get my notebook computer out and start writing down so that these, these thoughts that are coming to me. One of the things that was coming to me that day, just one of the things, but that was very important for the writing of this book. And although I had studied revivals, I had studied these re revivals in American history, I had never made this connection. And this is what was one of the thoughts that was flooding my mind was that there was a direct connection, a direct bearing of what historians have called the Great Awakening with the founding of our nation. Now, the Great Awakening, it is called by that name because there was such an unusual spiritual awakening at a time when people were thoughtless and indifferent about the things of God. This is how one of the founding fathers 
Benjamin Franklin described the populace of his hometown of Philadelphia, and he himself uh, did not profess to be a Christian, at least at that time. I believe there is evidence that he came to know the Lord before he died, and I, I have this in, in my book. And I'm going to turn around because I want to read some quotes from, from the book. But Benjamin Franklin described the populace of Philadelphia as thoughtless and indifferent about the things of God. Faultless and indifferent. And that probably describes maybe the majority of the populace of our nation today. Before Benjamin Franklin, earlier in the late 1600s, actually 1679, there was a group of ministers that met in Massachusetts, in New England. And they had this gathering because they were so concerned about the thoughtlessness and the indifference and the moral decline that they were observing all around them. And they issued a statement after their gathering, they issued a statement with this statement, God has a controversy with his New England people. God has a controversy with his New England people because of the thoughtlessness and the indifference to the things of God and the moral decline that they were observing all around them. But you know, there were some people that began to pray. There were some people who began to pray Sincerely, not formal prayers, not rote prayers, not prayers from the head up, not liturgical prayers. Now, I, I know that there can be value in those kinds of prayers uh, in, in certain situations, but we need to learn to pray prayers out of our heart, prayers of integrity, because God is a real person. And we can talk to him person to person as a real person. And there were people who were very concerned. And they began to call out to God. And they began to ask God to bring a change and to bring a spiritual awakening. And I will read a quote from a, a pastor, a minister in the early 1700s. And he makes, he makes this statement. He said that most of the churches had set apart days wherein to seek the Lord by prayer and fasting. And this wasn't some kind of legal ritualistic thing. This was done out of a sincere, deep concern about the state. Of the nation. This was actually before the nation was formed. It was, a, it was a colony of Great Britain, a population of approximately three million people, primarily along the eastern seaboard. He also added that there were annual fast days appointed by the government. Those earliest Americans didn't know anything about a separation of faith from government. Now we hear a lot about the separation of church and state. That statement is not in our Constitution. Not there. That statement, and that statement, you know, it, it was in the Soviet Union's Constitution, I understand the separation of church and state, but it is not in the American Constitution. It is used so much today you would think that it was there. But it is in none of the original official documents. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. I'll tell you where that statement came from because you're hearing it all the time on the news, the separation of church and state. And it is being used by secularists and anti-Christians to try to uh, like ban Christmas from the public schools, to ban Christmas trees, from uh, public squares to ban nativity scenes, uh, 
to keep students from wearing crosses or carrying their Bibles in school. The, we must have the separation of church and state. It's not in the American Constitution. I'll tell you right now where it came from. In the early 1800s, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the, uh, to the Association of Baptist Churches in Danbury, Connecticut. Now, Thomas Jefferson, our third president, and the author of, primary author of the Declaration of Independence was not a Baptist. He was a, a lifelong Anglican. But he wrote a letter to this Association of Baptist Churches in New England because they were concerned. This was after the United States of America had been formed. They were concerned how they would be treated in this new country that had been formed. Because you must understand that Baptists in Europe and in England had been treated terribly in Europe, which was primary, primarily Catholic, and then in uh, places like Germany, which became officially Lutheran, and then in England, which was first of all Catholic and then became officially Angl Anglican or the Church of England. And these official state churches did not allow other kinds of churches and so on. And by the Spirit of God, as the Spirit of God was poured out, there were these groups of communities that emerged and they were called Baptists because they believed in baptizing people after they expressed faith in Jesus Christ. Whereas the Anglicans, the, the Catholics, and the Lutherans, they sprinkled infants. These people said, no, you get baptized as a result of your faith in Jesus Christ. So we are only going to baptize people who are old enough to make a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. And they would also re-baptize people who had been sprinkled as Catholics or Anglicans. And this brought them under terrible persecution. I have read the persecutions of these people. They were imprisoned. And, and, and these were by, by religious people treating them like this. They were imprisoned. They would cut out their tongues. They would burn them at the stake. One thing they loved to do because, to them because they were Baptists. Did you know uh, religion without Christ can be very cruel? Christianity without Christ can be cruel. And these professing Christians, they would take these Baptists and they would, uh, they would one thing they would use, they, a, a long like a seesaw, a pole with a lever, and they would tie them to it. And they would dunk them under the water and hold them there. And then when they were on the verge of drowning, they would bring them back up again. And, and, uh, and, and, and not only torturing them, but humiliating them, we're baptizing you, you Baptist. And eventually they would drown them. And so there were many Baptists who fled to America looking for a safe harbor, a safe place to practice their faith in God. And so these Baptists, they were concerned. Here's a new nation that's been formed. Are they going to have some state official church? And they too will begin to persecute us? And President Thomas Jefferson wrote them a letter to calm their concerns, to soothe their fears and calm their concerns. And he said, in this nation that has just been formed, there will be a wall of separation. And he didn't use the terms between church and state. He said there will be a wall of separation. But Jefferson's wall of separation was unidirectional. Jefferson's wall of separation was to keep the government out of the church, to keep the government out of individual lives, to keep the government out of telling people how to practice their faith, how to worship God. And so Thomas Jefferson used that phrase, a wall of separation, 
to soothe and to calm the concerns of these people who were concerned that in this new nation they might come under persecution from, a, from this new state and from a new state church. And so Thomas Jefferson was saying, no, we're not going to have an official church. We're not going to have a state church. And we're going to have a wall of separation that's going to keep the government out of the church so that everyone is free to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. Folks, that's the truth about this phrase, separation of church and state. It is not in the Constitution, and it was used, when it was originally used, it was used to assure persecuted Christians that they would not be persecuted in this new land and that there would be a wall of separation keeping the government out of individuals' lives and out of the church. And so we need to realize that today because we are being attacked and bombarded on all kinds of fronts by secularists who would like to drive Christians completely out of the public arena. And so we need to know who we are as Americans, as American citizens, and we need to know not only the Bible, but we need to know, you know, how this nation was formed. And we need to know that this nation was birthed out of a great, spiritual awakening because going back I didn't know I was going to talk about this separation of church and state but apparently God wanted me to talk about that today maybe I'm talking to someone today who needed to hear this so that you will not be intimidated by anyone who would try to uh, intimidate you and and silence you Oh, it's time to stand up and declare our faith in Jesus Christ. You know, God spoke to me, as I said at the beginning. That day I was surprised by the Holy Spirit. That yes, our nation can see another great spiritual awakening. And folks, we desperately need it now. Will you join me in praying and asking God to do that very thing? Do it again. Lord, I thank you for each person that's watching me today. Lord, send another great spiritual awakening to this land. Let it start with us. Let it start with me. Let it start with that person that is sitting there watching this program right now. Let it start in their living room. Let it start right there. Let it start in the churches in Paris and Hugo and Clarksville and, and Red River Counties, Lamar County and uh, Choctaw County. Let it begin with us, oh God. I pray and I ask it in Jesus' name and I thank you for doing it. Amen. We'll go out with the song we started with. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life what more could. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, 